everybody, and first of all, on behalf of Patrick, Nathan, and myself, I'd like to welcome you <coughs> to the seminar on Gordon Hannington Noose. Um, Gordon, after over 50 years of living and working in Burma, Gordon Luce, his ideas about the country, its ancient past, its languages, and the origins of the Burmans, still command attention today, and this presentation will endeavour to contextualise his intellectual legacy and to understand the ways in which his scholarship may or may not still retain relevance for Burma studies today. So part one, which I'm starting now, begins by positioning Luce in Burma and looking at the ways in which his upbringing and early experiences may have inclined him towards a less restrictive life there, where he could pursue his intellectual interests and also be free to live without the social and family pressures that he faced in England. Well, here we've got a picture of our Gordon as a young man. This is the product of a late Victorian education at a minor public school in Cheltenham, Gloucestershire. And he spent his formative years at Emmanuel College, Cambridge, having rebelled in his youth against the puritanical severity of his family home at the vicarage of St. Nicholas in Gloucestershire, in Gloucester, where his father was the incumbent. As the 13th and youngest child of an evangelical Anglican clergyman, who abhorred the ritual and the theatre of the Church of Rome, Luce's upbringing was, in my view, devoid of refinement and cultural appreciation. He, Luce, was scornful of his father's denunciations from the pulpit, of the world of the flesh and the devil. He accused his father of despising art and literature as sensual creations and being serenely happy with his daily news, his Bible, and his Bradshaw. So Bradshaw is a Victorian railway guide, which people, like Lucy's middle class people, took the railways where it kept as almost a Bible. And here we have, like fuzzy, a photo of the Luce family, where I take Luke Gordon to be on the end here. And this is the dreaded Reverend Luce. And the rest of them are Mrs. Luce, the mother of 13 <coughs> children, and I don't know who the rest of his siblings are. I mean, I presume the one behind the mother might well be his sister Ethel. Lewis described his father as a bull bulwark of the Evangelical Church of England and a champion of Reformation doctrines whose word was law. Anyone who disagreed with him was called a block's head, a coxcomb, a sot, a puppy. And Lewis was forced to remain at home during the summer of 1911, where he studied for a scholarship to Cambridge, where he was reading for the literature Tripos. And he poured out the woes, this is where the source is, in a letter to the author Lytton Strachey, who was a member of the Bloomsbury set, which we'll get on to in a minute. He told, Luce told Strachey that he longed to escape the horrors of his low-brow, <coughs> restrictive home life. And he wrote, if I fail, presumably his scholarship, I must vanish at once beyond the black moons. Anyway, by October 1911, Luce had regained the freedom of Cambridge, which gave him the opportunity to make frequent weekend visits to London, where he mixed with the denizens of the sexually and socially liberated Bloomsbury set. Some of the group's best-known authors are Virginia Woolf, her sister Vanessa Bell, John Maynard Keynes, Arthur Whaley, who was the keeper of the Chinese collection at the uh, British Museum, and E.M. Foster, and of course, Lytton Strachey. Cambridge, Luce was invited to join the Apostles, which was an all-male secret society, painting society, so named because it only had 12 members. And they came under the influence of the, uh, the philosopher G.E. Moore, and, whose, a primer, and their prime objects in life were love, the creation and enjoyment of aesthetic experience, and the pursuit of knowledge. And when he was in Cambridge, Luce devoted most of his time to Southeast Asian studies and culture, studying the culture, the history, and the language. And this led uh, to his tutor, Mr. Greenwood, describing him as rather eccentric and a little irregular in making reports, presumably he didn't turn in his work, and doing some other routine work of that sort. So it's 
rather little wonder after he graduated that Luz sought the refuge in the silka and exotic world of Burma, where he lived among the people from 1912 to 1964. He studied its ancient ruins, its epigraphs, and he hoped that it might help him unlock the secrets of the country's gilded past, and especially the mysteries of Pagan, which he later valorised as the country's spiritual and cultural heart and the focal point of the country's Burma's national identity. No, one, sorry. This is a letter that might be of interest that on the boat out to, Bur out to India, to Bombay, in 1912, Luce travelled with E.M. Foster, and that was when E.M. Foster was going out to begin his research for his book, A Passage to India. And they became quite firm friends. And quite, quite poignantly, all through his life, that letter stated 1969, some months before Foster's death, and he wrote to say how much he had valued his father. Um, I do have the original there, but it's very uh, hated. But he said he thanked Luce for his wishes and wished, wished him well. Anyway, off we go. Second, next one, please. Anyway, initially, Luce's hopes that he had escaped the rigid moral standards of English society were dashed. He described his first year in Burma as miserable. He felt suffocated by the restrictions of his boarding house, which he'd been turned out of because they'd seen a Burman in his room. And in a letter to Long Maynard Keynes, Luce wrote that he'd moved out to live among the local population because he's driven to it by insult from the English. And he continued to correspond regularly with um, Luce, with um, Keynes, and he uh, was very enthusiastic about his encounters with young Burmese houseboys whom he called Lugalais, and you can notice how he describes in very fulsome tones the attentions that they, lack, they showered on him. Anyway, after leaving his boarding house, he did move <coughs> out to the suburbs of Burma to the, on the outskirts of Rangoon, where he lodged with the family of his lifelong friend, Kaimong Tin, and he commuted to work on a... He was working at Rangoon College, by the way, teaching English. And in those days, uh, Pei Mountain's home at Insane was out, is actually in the jungle, so Luce was very enchanted with the beautiful vegetation and some of the animals that he saw. And he, in time, became acquainted, well acquainted, with Pei Mountain's sister, who is the famous Titi, his wife of many years. I think they were married over 60 years. And he was, uh, married her in 1915. And then we have another slide here, and they moved, and there she is a few months before her death. They had a son and a daughter, and they married, and they lived there. Finally, she died on the island of Jersey. She came loose to England, of course, in 1964. So, Luce was a sensualist and a connoisseur of Burmese culture, history, and linguistics. And from the outset, as we've just seen, he eagerly embraced the country, its people, with a degree of intimacy, I believe, that was unthinkable for a member of the British colonising community in 1912 when the imperial idea and its values strictly enforced to shore up an increasingly tenuous grip on power in the face of rising nationalism. Unsurprisingly, some of this iconoclasm and his uh, wish to be close and live amongst the Burmese made him made it forfeit. He forfeited the opportunity to have had the chair of English in 1920 when the new Yangon University was founded. Uh, because the Governor General, Reginald Craddock, thought he was too Burmanized to hold the appointment. However, this perhaps was another key to Lewis's ability to live and work and to learn and to work on languages and history. He took a long sabbatical in Europe from 1921, I think, to 1923. And he studied here, not at SOAS, but so School of Oriental Studies, as it was named in 1917, under Charles Otto Blagden, where he learned um, pu, pu, Old Mom and Pew. And then he went to Paris, where he studied under the greats of Chinese history, uh, Louis Fino and Paul Pelliot, whom he admired. And he, Luce, wanted to continue the work of these men, and he was particularly keen to edit all the inscriptions found at Arva, which was the ancient capital, between 1609 and 1364. The period, he said, when Arva takes its place as the capital of Burma. And we think that at that time we probably didn't 
have any concept <coughs> of the country having any distinctive capital, except that Yangon was of course the colonial capital. But he named Ava or Pagan as, in his mind, the spiritual capital. Anyway, on his return to Natrangu uh, in 1923 with Titi, Luce's um, dedication to Oriental studies was rewarded because he got a readership in Far Eastern history, which perhaps was a key because his friend, D.G.E. Hall, Daniel Hall, he was the professor of, he'd been made professor of history, and Hall gave him carte blanche to do what he liked because he wanted to move away to widen the curriculum from ancient history which, believe it or not, was limited to the study of Greece and Rome and modern history, mainly European. So they only thought of Burmese history in those days as a subsidiary of Indian history or some add-on or adjunct. Anyway, he was able to place his own unique interpretation upon a subject that really had only received minor attention from European scholars. Anyway, over the next half century, Gordon Luce became one of colonial Burma's most distinguished scholars, focusing his work, much of his work, on the study of pre-Pagan period and on the city itself, examining its ancient history, architecture, epigraphy and languages. His investigations helped to elevate the historiography of Pagan to that of a golden age, which he believed saw the unification of the country under King Anuratha after the conquest of Taton in 10, oh, 1057. And his scholarship, through the Burma Research Society mainly, contributed towards the formation of a collective national inheritance for Burma. His lifetime's work on the history, iconography and architecture of Pagan resulted in many publications in the Journal of the Burma Research Society, which began in 1916 and in fact continued to very soon before his death in 1979. And his scholarship culminated in the publication of, in three volumes between 1969 and 1970 of what one might call his magnum opus, Old Burma and Early Bacan. His work was only interrupted when the, public of the publication of the journal was suspended during the Japanese occupation of, uh, in, 18, in 1942. And so they, but Luce and his wife, along with many other uh, Europeans, fled Burma and spent the war years in uh, Britain. He lived in Gloucester. I'm not entirely sure what he did then. He did receive a letter from the BBC uh, from George Orwell asking him to do something, but I don't think he was particularly well occupied. However, they went back in 1945 and they re were able to regain this home for waifs and strays, which Titi herself, rather interestingly, had established as orphans, uh, young on orphans, which she'd established in uh, 1928. Unfortunately, when Luce returned to Burma, he was devastated to find that all his research materials had been lost. They'd been stored in the library of... Um, University Library and the Japanese had bombed it just before they left or just before they evacuated. So he spent the rest of his life um, looking to try and rebuild the collection. So he spent, and this is, Luce was a keen gymnast at Cambridge and uh, that was his contribution to the boys, uh, to the boys of the home, of Titi's home for Waste and Strays. So anyway, he divided the rest of his life to rebuilding his archive, and although much of it was irreplaceable, and apart from a brief period in the 1950s when he was accepted a visiting uh, professorship here at SOAS, he and his wife remained in Burma until ordered to leave by Pei uh, uh, Win in 1964. Thereupon they retired to Jersey, which I should point out was where the original family came from. His father, the Reverend Luce, was a Jersey man, and he, I don't know, there was a house available for him, I think made through the donation of his sister, Ethel, who was the only one I understand that he had any contact with. But when he left Burma, even though he'd built up his archive, he was not permitted to take any of his research materials with him. But however, a year or so later, the British ambassador uh, interceded and uh, he got them, finally they were shipped back to him. 
where he was able to establish an impressive library. And he received, during the latter years of his life, many scholars, people would come and see him to talk over the work. And sadly, um, in the years preceding his death, with his sight failing, he spent many months, trying, to, with his help of his children, trying to get uh, SOAS, this is what, so, to take over his archive. However, they declined. It seemed from looking at correspondence that the key players in the decision were former academics, somebody called Harry Shorto, who, and also Luce had a student as well, a Burmese student called La Pay, and Professor Eugenie Henderson. Uh, but Shorto was a Mon Khmer linguist, and Luce objected. He wanted a Burman to, he said, or presumably La Pay or somebody similar, to uh, oversee the uh, archive. However, in the end, SOAS declined to purchase it, and the whole lot ended up in Canberra in Australia. So that concludes, really, a short uh, positioning of Luce to tell you that he died finally in 1989 on the island of Jersey. And t yeah, 79, I'm sorry, 19, he was born in 1889, he died in 1979, and his wife um, predeceased him. She predeceased his wife, and she died a few years later. I always felt very sorry for Titi after having ma man magnificently gone over to, to, to Jersey, because Luce wrote once, Titi fears the cold of summer as much as she does winter. Anyway, that's it, and we now welcome Patrick, who will talk to us about Burma, the ideas that the British brought to Burma that changed history writing, and also his ideas about the migration. Thank you.